Hello, my name is Amy O'Leary and I'm with Strategies for Children in Massachusetts. And today we are gonna share our experience of looking back to look forward in Massachusetts, talking about lessons learned, highlights of progress made, example of impact and opportunities for action. And today with me, I have uh, Chrissy Howard, Taisha Ware and Melissa Blissett from Springfield, Massachusetts, Jenny Art and Representative Andy Vargas from Haverhill, Massachusetts. And we are going to share the stories of the communities as well as some of the progress that we have made at the statewide level. And so first, Strategies for Children works to ensure that Massachusetts invests the resources needed for all children from birth through age five to access high quality early education programs that prepare them for su success in school and for life. We are an advocacy policy organization. We are a nonprofit organization. And these are the areas that we have been working in since 2000. And as we get started, just a little bit of context about Massachusetts. This is from this uh, 2010 census. And the, some of these numbers are pre COVID. So the total population in Massachusetts, you can say is about, it's, between 6.5, 6 6.8 million. We have about 70,000 babies born in Massachusetts. You can see that 71.2% of children under the age of six have all parents in the workforce. We have a mixed provider system of early education and care. We have about 400 operating school districts and we do not have a state funded pre-K program yet. We also have three state agencies in Massachusetts that oversee education. You can see our governor is Charlie Baker, and there is an executive office of education led by our secretary, Jim Pizer. And then we have three education agencies, early education and care, elementary and secondary education, and then higher education. Each agency has a commissioner and a board, and each uh, oversees certain uh, cohorts of ages of children. And this is really what got us thinking in Massachusetts about uh, reading proficiency. Strategies for Children has been working uh, for a long time advocating for high quality early education. And as we thought about third grade as the first indicator of how we see how children are doing in our state, we started looking at the data. Like many of you out there, uh, folks were surprised to see the data statewide, even more surprised to see what the data looked like at the local level. And you can see since 2001, what our, um, our progress looks like. Something that was um, different about Massachusetts is often we are number one in the country in reading proficiency. And if you look and double clicked into the data, you could see that number one was certainly not good enough. You'll see a break in the data, and that is where we have a new generation of third grade reading uh, tests. And we expect scores to go down you know, when a new, um, uh, uh, a new exam is put in place. But you can see that the numbers really have not increased um, in the way that we really would hope to see them. And you can see the achievement gap in this slide. You can see the spread uh, between non-economically disadvantaged students and economically um, non -dis and, and disadvantaged students. And our work in Massachusetts really started with doing some research, first understanding the data and looking at the trend lines at the state level and local levels, but then really turning to experts. And in 2010, we worked with Noni, Dr. Noni Lasso, a literacy, early literacy expert, and we commissioned this report, Turning the Page, Refocusing Massachusetts for Reading Success. Uh, this is still available. We have uh, copies available. We'll make sure we have that uh, information because it really looked at the components of what we need to think about when we think about supporting early literacy in children. We use the recommendations from that report to file a bill in Massachusetts. And you can see here, this was the day that Governor Deval Patrick signed the bill in 2012. And it was a great day for children and families. And the bill really looked at uh, a couple of different parts. It established a nine member early literacy panel that was really thinking about advising those three education agencies on the alignment, coordination, implementation of all of these buckets. So curriculum, 
effective instruction, professional development and training, and developmentally appropriate assessment, along with family partner, partnership strategies. And as I said, those recommendations really came from the work of the report that Noni wrote. We saw this piece of legislation as a first step and it did help to establish early literacy as a state priority. That panel also had representations from all three education agencies, which was key, and really helped us think about this long-term alignment and resource allocation. Where are we spending dollars? There was strong executive and legislative support for the bill, as well as moving forward with this as a priority. We knew the recommendations were gonna inform current and future plans. And we saw that in many of the federal plans for Race to the Top. And even today, when we think about the uh, American Rescue Package that's coming down from the federal government, it really was an opportunity, and we use the word infiltrate other state policies. And it really helped us think about working with communities to inform the policy and the policy helping to, to support the communities. Back then, we also created the Massachusetts Reading Proficiency Learning Network. And this was an opportunity for uh, the campaign communities, which at the time were Boston, Holyoke, Pittsfield, Springfield, and Worcester, Massachusetts. We met with these communities to think about best practices, to share how folks were implementing um, some of the recommendations from the report, especially around uh, community work and, and supporting parents and engaging in their young children's learning. And what we saw as a result of the work of the statewide work, as well as the work of the communities, was that we really were able to raise awareness of what being number one actually means in Massachusetts and for children at both the state and the local level. The Early Literacy Panel released four reports uh, to really talk about what the recommendations were, looking at things like assessment and screening. We continue on our quest for data for to better understand how children are doing at different stages of development and how we can track their progress. We did see some alignment of the birth to 12th grade policies. And while today the work may look different in the communities than it looked when we started, we know that the work continues in these communities, in the campaign communities, as well as other communities who are working to think about this birth uh, through end of grade 12 pipeline. And some of the ways that we've seen impact and infiltration are these two examples I just wanted to share quickly. One is the Massachusetts Equity Education Equity Partnership put out report in 2018, which spanned early education through higher education uh, that was really focused on number one for some. It really was looking at uh, during the 25th anniversary of our education reform bill in Massachusetts to look back to see what progress we have made and where there were gaps. We also have seen the state uh, work together at the executive level to create the early childhood integrated data system. And this is a, a data system that provides valuable insights to inform and improve the administration and the impact of programs serving young children. And it, the data has been aggregated, deduplicated, and de-identified and analyzed so that we really can think about uh, what, what's happening for children. And as you can see, it was made possible through the preschool development grant and was signed in 2020. And so right now, this is a tool that they are using within the agency level uh, to really think about how we can look at the data and make better policies using the data as a driver. But what we have learned over all of this is that community is where, where the action is at. So you can see these are the six communities that have been part of the campaign for grade level reading. We started with Springfield, Massachusetts, which was one of the first communities uh, in the campaign. And our most recent addition has been Haverhill. So today we're gonna hear from representatives from both of those communities to give us a little bit of the history talk about how they got started, and most importantly, to really sh uh, share with us what's happening at the local level and how we can continue to support children in those communities. So right now, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Chrissy Howard from Springfield, and she is gonna get started with some slides and to share some information. So Chrissy, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you, Amy, for all of your leadership 
in in this work thus far and in, in really bringing, making sure we have that, that statewide voice and that we're aligned in our work because I think without that kind of guidance over the years, we really, really, it's hard to pull us all together. It's hard to work locally and and act on a, on a larger stage. So we really appreciate your leadership. So uh, my name is Chrissy Howard. I um, run Reading Success by fourth grade out of Springfield, one of the very first campaign for grade level reading cities um, in the country, very exciting. Um, so I'm here with our family literacy advocates, um, Taisha Weir and Melissa Blissett, and I'll run down a little bit of our history and, and get moving. So. Um, from 2008, the Irene E. and George A. Davis Foundation founded Cherish Every Child, um, which was a project focused on improving early life experiences. And this, um, as Amy mentioned, um, the Davis Foundation uh, very generously supported a lot of the research from um, the report from Dr. Lasso. Um, and through that research, consultants, local advisory groups, um, they discovered this research on reading and moved specifically to early literacy. Um, so much of the work that was being done was pointing to the high outcomes for children when they are able to be reading on grade level by the end of third grade. That MCAS in Massachusetts is our measurement. Um, for a while it was PARC and now back to MCAS 2.0. And um, that's the data that we track um, to try to understand where, where we can make our greatest impact. There's a huge still, a huge um, economic um, advantage um, and, and gap here in, in Massachusetts and across the country and across the world. And those are major issues and driving forces behind our work. Um, in uh, the past uh, decade or more, I'm happy to say, um, there's definitely been built up a sense of purpose and urgency. Um, folks are aware from our business colleagues, our coalition to um, many business leaders for education, um, that reading matters, that this is important, um, and that it's a priority. Um, the foundation had really worked to, to move and infiltrate a policy across the state and across the country um, to move and prioritize early literacy on, and amongst the many, many priorities that folks have working with young children. Um, they did a lot of convening and coalition building. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of people involved in this work and I'm so happy to um, be able to be leading this work in the past three years. Major accomplishments across the city, across the board, these are four of many, many, many. Um, the idea that we're convening annually, that we talk about um, these issues as a community, that we have the mayor and other um, very influential local political folks, but also that statewide attention is here when it comes to larger issues. Um, we have a community data warehouse, which is a um, clearinghouse of early literacy and early childhood data. It's available to programs in the community, but also through S um, our Springfield Public Schools. We have a completely open um, and transparent clear impact scorecard where we monitor data points um, that impact early literacy based on a lot of this research. And we work together with planning commissions, with public health institutes, with a variety of research and data organizations to help us make sure that this is accurate, up to date and usable. We have so much data uh, and we wanna make sure that people can use it to, to do better. Um, we have had multiple All America City Awards, Paysetter Awards from Campaign for Grade Level Reading, and um, we have a citywide preschool curriculum. Um, we in our mixed delivery system, uh, many, many community partners and the public schools all agree to use um, certain um, curriculum in their classrooms, and we um, consistently work to support that. So we're really happy about that. Um, I am... Oh, knew that was gonna happen today. Highlights, so awesome things going on. I feel like I could put a thousand pictures here of how many amazing things we've been able to do just in the last few years. Um, our number one awesomeness is um, our family literacy advocates, which you'll hear from um, Melissa and Ty in just a minute about uh, kind of our program and how we're, we're working to elevate families as not only their child's first teacher, but as experts not in their children and in our neighborhoods. 
Um, our 413 families and 413 families texting program is over 3,500 um, families engaged um, in our texting service. And we work to give them information about um, educative opportunities in the city, in the area that are free or fun um, and that help build our early literacy skills across the board. Um, we had held um, recently um, in building a lot of our capacity um, of our early childhood folks, we held a conference for Springfield educators, free for our Springfield educators, um, with a lot of our focus being on our common curriculum, literacy, um, birth to kindergarten. We had over 600 attendees this year. Um, very exciting. Um, we're looking to move forward with that um, for next year as well. Um, in our community, we have um, 10 story walks and book nooks go up every summer and fall for families to enjoy um, just reading where they are, wherever looks good for them. And our family literacy advocates are leaders on those. Um, in our community, we also have our summer of 30,000 books. It's kind of a lot of books and we're getting them out to kids and families all summer. Uh, we're very excited to help build home libraries, especially after COVID when we're all at home reading the same books over and over again. As a mom, I need some new books. <laughs> so um, we are also in our community investing in our out of school time staff uh, and leaders um, with a fellowship. It's a paid fellowship with coaching, support, training for their staff, all on early literacy practices and skills that go to support all of the work that the public schools are doing and that we're seeing before school, after school and summer programs and camps. Um, our Springfield Reads, we're reading um, all the time in every program. So far we have 16 programs in all the summer schools that kids are reading at least 20 minutes every day to each other on their own um, as part of their actual schedule. And we are counting out how many minutes our kids are reading. In a pre-COVID time, we were up to almost 700,000 minutes a summer, which is really cool. Uh, and now in a COVID time, we're still keeping track and we're trying to help kids have access to summer programs. Um, in our uh, convening category, we've, got, uh, we've had early literacy leadership summits, which um, you'll see on our top picture here, um, one was with um, Dr. June Laley from Harvard talking to us about the value of our relationships and how we build things together. Um, and we kind of just reinvigorate our community with, with the importance and that sense of urgency. Our Literacy Champion Awards honor people doing the work already in Springfield and how amazing and wonderful that is. Melissa and Ty both have received that award in the past, Sally as well. Um, a lot of our, our local leaders and and people who are just really influencing the lives of kids and families in early literacy. And again, we continue to work on our pace setter awards and are recognized for some of these highlights. Um, sorry, two times every time. Um, our impact, we, um, a few highlights of this, we continue to um, support that common um, pre-K curriculum throughout the city. Um, working hopefully uh, this year as well with hundreds of educators and thousands of preschoolers every year are engaging in this common curriculum. Um, the, they've done a lot of work around um, integrating early literacy practices based on a lot of the, uh, the mass literacy work that's done from that 2012 work that everyone has been putting so much um, amazing time and energy and effort into. Um, again, we had our conference, over 600 educators, and most have already committed to the 22 conference, which is really exciting. Um, other capacity building we've done has been training over 400 librarians, museum educators, playgroup leaders, social workers, our informal educators, those who uh, do outreach in housing and in medical and healthcare partners, to in, in ways to engage families in literacy activities with race and equity lens. I think that's a new focus for us and one that's really important because the gap is there and we can't ignore it. It needs to be addressed directly. In terms of our strategic alignment, we have um, sustained, expanded and deepened partnerships with over 75 organizations serving Springfield. Some are statewide, some are national and some are hyper-local. Um, we are investing in us. We are um, using a strategy to um, financially um, 
pay, we're, we're paying people who are doing the work now. Uh, we're not really going outside and looking for a lot of folks to come in and, and tell us where we need to do better. We're finding great places here and we're, um, we're putting our resources there. Um, we have our OST fellowship, our family literacy advocates, our paid um, stipended positions so that we, you know, take from Springfield and grow. Uh, we, we as a city are amazing um, and resilient and smart and, and we have a lot to offer. And so we're investing financially in the people doing that. Um, we continue to develop strategy and engage stakeholders um, for a variety of early literacy practices across many sectors. Um, we've actually recently gotten into um, literacy environments where kids are waiting. So banks, doctor's offices, um, therapist offices. And so even um, with office staff discussing like what makes for good reading spaces um, along with a lot of other ways to engage kids and families. And we continue to refocus um, the literacy equity for families and kids in Springfield. And this really um, comes into play in meeting families and kids where they are. If we're at laundromats, then we go to laundromats. If we're in libraries, we go to libraries and, and really trying to be in the community as much as possible. Our, yeah, one time, okay, COVID pivots um, have been important and scary and good for us and for, for folks. Um, we have this joke, it's virtually everything um, had to change. And so we went virtual with everything. Um, that 600 person conference was gonna be an awesome, amazing, like M new MGM, new Matthew Joel, like in-person thing. It's online and it was so cool. Um, we had um, Laura Washington from the Kale, and we had um, Tabitha Rossbroy, National Teacher of the Year, who's the first pre-K teacher to ever receive that honor. We're able to attend um, much more easily because we were virtual. And so a lot of folks, we actually increased the access by, by holding that event virtually. We um, increased our four and three families and familias engagement, um, providing resources for at-home learning, and, assisting families in more two-way engagement via texting. And we're, um, we're looking to increase that support with um, opting families into Ready for K, which is a, another developmental texting program. Um, and our essential family childcare supports, um, there's a picture here of a family childcare um, provider. There were 12 open family childcares in the city of Springfield for uh, the beginning part of the pandemic that were taking in kids, new kids every day, seeing kids sometimes like just doing what needs to get done. And we were able to give them books and supplies and toilet paper and masks back when you couldn't get those things and paper towels and um, crayons that were back ordered for months um, to be able to service those kids with their individual items was really tricky. Um, we also got them tons of books and learning activities and um, those, all women um, were so grateful and are still some of our biggest uh, cheerleaders. <laughs> and um, we, we really have this great connection now as, as things are opening up, um, but they, they're just held, held it down for the city. So we help them out. Um, and we continue to work on uh, issues of equity and access specifically around um, internet access, access to books um, and access to text for kids and families. Um, just relating specifically to the COVID crisis. Um, I'd love to um, hear from um, Ty and Melissa on their experiences in our, you know, they've been here longer than me um, and um, they've hold, been holding it down for some time as we had some transitions in leadership, but would love to hear highlights from them as well. I can go first. Um, so I, when we joined, both Ty and I joined um, Reading Success by fourth grade, um, we actually started out with uh, social media. I know I actually saw Ty and it's almost like it takes a village and sometimes you model behaviors and that's how it started. So Ty was literally posting pictures of her son um, reading books and posting it on both Instagram and Facebook. And I was like, hmm, I should do the same thing. And um, that's when Reading Success by Fourth Grade found us. 
And um, they saw a need for family literacy advocates. So the 413 text, text messaging campaign started as, a techno uh, as technology was an easy access for communication and for families to learn about reading and also to attend free activities in our community. So we would huddle up together about once a month trying to figure out um, best practices on getting the families engaged into reading. Um, so over the years, uh, we found out the goal for the, this advocacy group is to like learn about child development, literacy, and adv advocacy to have great conversations, as well as po promoting positive parent-child interaction. The more you read with your family, the, the better bonding that you have with them. Uh, we also lead in like literacy events. Uh, we have activities in our neighborhoods and also um, just try to get together as much as possible, share ideas and also exchange books if possible. And also advocating to our community and just letting them know what is needed for families when it comes to early literacy. Um, I like love the ASQs, the Ages and Stages Questionnaire is like a tool that I actually found out for, uh, from before actually when my daughter was born. And I would do that to, um, I would do the screening for myself and for her just to see where she's at in her reading development. And, and the fact that it's happening here in Springfield, we were living in Philly at the time and seeing that everyone is utilizing this to see where your child is at and um, understanding that there are resources in the community to help with early literacy. Thank you so much, Melissa. You're welcome. Well, so did a really good job summarizing them. So I'll just add a little bit to it. She kind of gave you a great overall of how we got started and some of the work that we're doing, but just to reiterate her point of modeling. And like, we both truly believe that it really takes a village and whether you're raising your own kids or you're in the community involved with other kids, that village is so important to sustain anything, any type of positive development, um, any type of relationship. So just knowing what I was doing at home and then thinking like, wow, I should share this because it's, this is important. It's really helping my young child. I have a 10 year old and a six year old. Um, so at the time it was my 10 year old that I was like also still involved with my six year old, but heavily involved with my 10 year old. Um, and it was really important for me, particularly as a mother with a black son, when I started to read how society views black boys in particular when it comes to reading and when it comes to school. And if you're not on grade level, like what happens and what does society think is supposed to happen? It was really important for me to understand that and then share that with my community. We're both born and raised in Springfield. So just being able to walk outside and connect with other families and share what we've learned to help families grow within their own reading literacy and make those connections with their families and their children is just really, really important. And we've been able to do that work through this. Thank you, Ty. So yeah, they, um, these women are amazing and stellar leaders in our community. I'm so proud to be able to work with them um, and really have spearheaded a lot of this, um, just the idea of family literacy advocates and, and having like, we want what's best for our kids. I'm, I'm a Springfield mom too. We want what's best for our kids and we have really good ideas of how that should happen. And that's what we're doing. And we're giving folks the language to talk about it, the giving them the, um, the space and place to be centered and and have folks listen. So we're doing a lot of great stuff. We're still on the Facebook and the Instagram and the Twitter, LinkedIn, all that social media is going great. Um, a lot of people are really engaging and it's, it's fun to see. It's great to be a part of. Well, thanks so much, Chrissy. I think, you know, the long history, keeping momentum is so challenging for anything, but especially, you know, when you're um, trying to keep it around early supporting parents, Parents are thinking of so many different things, um, especially it was so interesting to hear about COVID and how you were able to respond and react and then be proactive and really think about what's it going to take. And we, we can't stop doing this, um, even if we're in a global pandemic. And um, we hope to have a conversation with Sally Fuller as well to add to the list of resources, um, who, was, who was really the person in Springfield who got this started while she was at the Davis Foundation. John Davis, obviously, also one of the leaders of the foundation who really wondered where the outrage was when people saw the data about what was happening for young children and families. So as we switch gears, I'm actually gonna start with our representative um, from the Massachusetts State Legislature, Representative Andy Vargas. 
who, um, as we get started, um, when you think about your community, uh, how did you get started? And what, you know, where you were kind of the brainchild and the, the host of some of this early work in Haverhill. So can you talk a little bit about what motivated you to get started and then ultimately get Haverhill connected to the campaign? Sure, thank you, Amy. And it's great to be here with our sister city of Springfield. I think it's safe to say that without Springfield, I don't think we got a Haverhill. Um, there was a moment where a pediatrician here named Dr. John Maddox told us that we needed to take a trip out to Springfield to witness what was happening over there because there was some magic happening in Springfield. And so myself, a couple of school committee members and a pre-K um, uh, principal uh, all decided to drive uh, to Springfield and back in the same day uh, to witness what was happening in, in Springfield. And we were inspired by what we heard uh, when, when Ralph came to visit. Uh, we were at the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, it was truly an awesome experience. And I said, how do we get that? How do we do that? Um, and I think one of the things that was key for us was when we brought this back to Haverhill, we asked the community uh, what the appetite was to put in the work to do this. Uh, because it's one thing for us to say, we think it's worth doing this, but we knew that if, in order for us to be as successful as Springfield or the other communities across the country that have done this, we needed to have that cross-sector collaboration happening. And we needed commitments from people around being willing to meet on a you know, monthly basis first and bi-weekly basis in some cases. And so we did that, right? We had a couple of stakeholder meetings where we invited uh, the healthcare sector, the, obviously the schools, uh, Barnes and Nobles, the business community, any entity that wanted to play a role. And we essentially asked, you know, what is the appetite to do this work? How interested are you in focusing on summer learning? How interested are you in focusing in attendance and readiness? Um, and through that, we developed a buy-in from the community uh, that said, yes, we want to do this. We want to put in the work. After we did that, um, we had to figure out what's, what's the best model, right? How do we actually set up a campaign, right? Because there's different models. Do we need a full-time director living within the schools or living within the library? Or is this a nonprofit? Or how do we actually get this up and running? And so through that process, my office hosted two fellows from Brandeis University that did some research around the different uh, governance structures that exist for grade level reading campaigns across the country. And throughout that process, uh, we came back to the community again and said, this is what we found, right? And that was over six months of research and, and, and looking at what other communities were doing and best practices. And when we presented that to the community, um, it became clear that we wanted to have at least one full-time person waking up every single day thinking about grade level reading in the district. That unless we had somebody doing that, uh, it was going to be very difficult to coordinate all these different pieces uh, across the system uh, here in Haverhill. Um, and luckily, we ended up with an amazing uh, first executive director in Jenny Arndt, who has been fantastic. Um, and so what I, I mentioned that entire process just to highlight that, you know, usually it's not a state representative that's like convening and, and trying to, you know, start a grade level reading campaign. Uh, but I don't say that to toot my own horn, but for anyone that's watching uh, from a community that might be thinking about this, you could be the one, right? You, you, you have convening power and authority in your community, whether you're an elected official, a school official, a parent, a teacher, uh, you have a narrative, a story, and you have power to convene people together uh, for something as powerful as grade level reading. Um, for me, that I'm motivated um, to work on this issue because I grew up in a very big and large and loud Dominican family. And um, I was very blessed to have two parents um, and uh, parents that really looked out for me and pulled me out of the streets and um, didn't have, I, I had a peaceful, you know, not peaceful, but I had a safe home to grow up in. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, I couldn't say the same for all my cousins. Um, and they're like my brothers to this day. And they're just as smart as I am. They're just as uh, hardworking as I am. Uh, but they were born into households that weren't the same as mine. And I know that any one of them could be a state representative or could be anything that they wanted if the village stepped in uh, when the household was not uh, full. Uh, and I, for me, when I think about my role as an elected official, it's to figure out ways to ensure that we're balancing the playing field so that every young person, every individual can live up to their full potential, regardless of the household that they're born into. 
Uh, I think we owe it to ourselves and to our neighbors and to our community to make sure that every kid can live up to everything that's possible for them. Um, and so that's what brought me to this issue. And that's why I'm still here working on this issue. Um, and that's why I'm so glad that we have Jenny Arndt here in Haverhill waking up every single day thinking about grade level reading. Uh, and we got lucky because she has a creative and artistic background as well, uh, which has really helped us with our messaging and our marketing and making sure that we're getting the word out about this campaign. So she'll tell you more about all the amazing things that have happened already, uh, but I can't sing Jenny's praises enough. Um, we, we wouldn't have gotten anything that we have gotten done so far without her leadership here in Haverhill. So. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Amy, for having me. Thank you, Representative. And one of the questions we'll ask folks at the end of our discussion today is kind of what they hope elected officials know about their work and about what it's like to be a parent. And you are an elected official. So what, how can we help spread the word? And then what would you want your colleagues to know about your experience and kind of this issue more broadly? Yeah, I mean, look, this is the, when we talk about going upstream, this is it, right? I mean, this is making sure that we're hitting the multi, multiple facets of that upstream, right? Because there are some people that can tell you, well, let's just focus on, you know, early education, which we absolutely, we need to, right? We need to put more into early education. But what are we doing for the kids that have just passed pre-K, they're in kindergarten, they're in first, they're in second, they're in third grade, and they're already behind. We need to still provide those interventions and supports. And so it's really that sweet spot between birth to end of grade three that we need to look at the quote unquote as the quote unquote upstream, right? Um, and I think that my other message is, you know, a lot of times we look for quick wins, right? Quick fixes. Um, and our political system can sometimes incentivize that, right? Every two years, we have to talk about what we've done, what we've accomplished. And there is a lot that we've done and accomplished through Haverhill Promise and uh, the grade level reading campaign that we've launched here. But I think it's also our responsibility to um, tell the story of how we have quick wins, we have small wins for grade level reading, but how the real wins are gonna come, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now when we see where these young people are and how they're living up to their full potential. So for every elected official that's out there, uh, number one, realize that you have convening power to make this happen, right? A lot of times we only view our offices from the straight procedural tools that we have in our toolbox, you know, budget, policy, legislation, but there's another bucket and that is the convening power bucket. And so view that as a tool in your toolbox uh, to, to make change in your communities. Thank you so much, Representative. We're gonna give Jenny a chance to set up her uh, presentation, but just wanna thank you for your leadership and for your clear message, not just to elected officials, but to everybody and the role that they can play in supporting children's development. And you know, as Strategies for Children, who has been you know, ambas the ambassador of this work, uh, it's so exciting to see a community go back to you know, work within itself and make the commitment to do this. So we're so glad um, to have your leadership as well as uh, all of the hero promises become. So we know you have to run rep. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'm gonna now turn it back to Jenny uh, to share some more information about Haverhill. Oh, and you're muted, Jenny. The slides were smooth. <laughs> you know, it was bound to happen, wasn't it? <laughs> You'd think we would know how to do this by now, after all this time. Oh, well, I, I'm uh, bummed that my, the state rep has to sign off. I, I wanted to let him know. I always chuckle every time he says that, you know, they were looking for someone who wakes up every morning thinking about grade level reading, because um, to be honest, it, I think it actually just keeps me up most nights. <laughs> so I think many of you on this call can probably agree with that. Um, so, you know, Andy has done just a fantastic job of Kind of sharing the history of Haverhill Promise and um, you know prior to to me getting hired as the campaign director and so you know I won't reiterate too much of that other than you know the state rep and and um, the local pediatrician Dr. Maddox were um, just so instrumental in getting our community to rally around this um, issue of grade level reading and um, really those first couple of years 2017 2018 um, as you can see on this slide were they were about inspiration and motivation. And, you know, Springfield really was such an inspiration for that group that went out um, and visited and just the knowledge that they came home with um, was and just really the passion that they came home with um, was really what sparked 
at all for Haverhill. And, um, you know, I, I think it also kind of gave us a little bit of a, a competitive thing going on. Um, Springfield is uh, one of the Massachusetts gateway cities. There's 26 of us that are considered gateway cities. And, you know, we've kind of been looking at how, how we square up with comparable cities who, um, you know, most of these gateway cities were um, very successful industrial cities for a long time um, and then have sort of had to bounce back from that over the years um, and have, you know, higher poverty rates um, and things like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's been awesome to look at Springfield as an inspiration, but say, hey, what, else, what can we do? What can Haverhill do, um, you know, to shine as brightly as Springfield has all these years? So we're, we're super grateful for Chrissy and her team and um, the inspiration that you all have given us here on the Eastern part of the state. And in terms of uh, motivation, really that number in 2017 of only 30% of Haverhill third graders um, reading proficiently, that spoke to people. You know, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I didn't know um, as a parent who is raising, uh, she's 10 now, but at the time I got hired, she was falling right into that age range that, you know, we're trying to work with here in the city and, and seeing that so many of her peers were, were struggling. And I had no idea as someone who grew up in Haverhill and, you know, really lived here most of my life. Um, that was eye opening. And so the first couple of years were really about sharing that we, we need to, you don't know what you don't know. So anything that we could do to um, just let the community know that really th this is what the data, data says. It's, um, it's telling a story and um, it's a story that we need to work on. And um, also with the wonderful Brandeis students that um, Andy was able to, to bring in, they did a ton of research from uh, other grade level reading communities and best practices and um, really brought all of the, the numbers and everything that we needed to really get motivated. And then the next step was really activation. We had to find the people that were willing to do this work with us. And I can just say uh, from my prior uh, job history, prior to working with Haverhill Promise, uh, I was the, um, I ran an arts nonprofit in the city called Creative Haverhill. And I must tell you in the arts world, you know, pe people seem to think art is a nice idea. And um, it was always very difficult to get people to come out or to donate or, you know, to do much in terms of supporting the arts in the city. As soon as we switch to this um, grade level reading, people get it. They understand the impact um, and just the amount of people that have come out of the woodwork and, and wanted to donate of their time, of their energy, all of their resources, money has been um, incredibly encouraging um, as a leader in this effort. Um, and so that's really what started to happen around 2019. Um, we started to build our working groups around the, the three priority areas of school readiness, summer learning, and school attendance. Um, we also have kind of a, another arm of um, work going on with book collection and distribution. There were some um, community members that were passionate about ensuring that books stayed within our community. You know, we found that so many people had shelves and shel families had shelves of books, um, you know, barely used, practically brand new that their kids were done with. They were donating them to savers in, in Plastown, New Hampshire, our neighborhood city, our, our neighboring city, and our own teachers were going and buying those books. And so we said, hey, we got to figure out a way to keep those books in our city and get them back out to families who need them. So that's been kind of a, another cool work group that's formed. Um, and, and then really, um, the, probably the biggest thing was, was actually developing our community solutions action plan um, using the framework that the campaign for grade level reading established. And, you know, what a, what a wonderful, um, I guess, way to go about this was to, to go through that framework and to come up with a true community solution. And um, in, in our case, we, we intended to submit our CSAP um, in the spring of 2020. And as we all know, um, catastrophic world event happened um, just about that time. And, you know, personally, it was, it was discouraging. We were, we were just getting ready to submit that, just finishing up details. And suddenly, many of the ideas and strategies we had developed were no longer relevant. Um, our other priorities surfaced. And, you know, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the COVID pivot. Um, 
but in hindsight, I, I truly believe that um, it was the best thing that could have happened for our community. Uh, Cause what it did was it, it gave us some time to step back. Um, we actually relaunched our work groups, um, pulling in some partners that we, we noticed that we were missing, some leaders that were really gonna be able to um, implement the plan once it was done. Um, and surprisingly, you know, we had much better turnout when we were doing things virtually than when we were trying to meet in person. Um, and so we sort of went, went back to square one um, in writing our, our CSAP. And I believe that it became a much stronger document that is definitely going to um, take us further than the original draft would have. Um, it's much more focused and um, a, a truer community solution. So um, all things work together for good, I guess, is what, what we're getting at. And now here we are. Um, so we did end up submitting our CSAP in, um, I believe it was March of this year. And, and now we're into the implementation. Now it's, it's go time. We have the plan. Um, we know the goals that we want to achieve. We have great strategies in place and um, we have the energy um, and the motivation around it. So um, that's sort of where we're at at this point. All right, and so just for some highlights, um, so we did complete our community solutions action plan, as I said, um, and became a, an official grade level reading community. Um, so that's been exciting. We were also recognized as a campaign for grade level reading bright spot for 2021 because of some of our creative um, COVID projects that I'll share in just a moment. Um, we're very excited that we've been able to add 30 new drop-in literacy events for ages zero to 10 this summer. Um, we were really uh, worried about some of the preschool students and students that didn't attend kindergarten last year due to the pandemic. Um, and so these, uh, we're calling them literacy lunches have been an opportunity for families to show up and, and have a lunch and hear a story and really practice some of those school readiness skills that maybe they hadn't practiced ever or in a long time of sitting and hearing a story and following instructions um, and just being around their peers. So that's been wonderful. Um, we've also added, we have about 30 plus active community partner organizations right now, which um, we're, we're really proud of you know, some more active than others, but, um, but everybody really working together and understanding the mission, which I think was sort of the, the biggest thing. Um, and everybody trying to find their own unique ways to support what we're doing. We also have around 50 plus active volunteers that are plugged into our working groups, our steering committee, um, and um, coming together around a project and then disbanding, which, you know, is, is kind of a great way to plug um, folks in, we found, you know, um, where the energy is, you know, bringing these, these folks in for um, just a few weeks to get a project done and then, you know, they may join up on another team later on and, and it's been great because um, then those folks don't get burnt out. Um, so we're loving that. We've distributed around 2,500 new children's books in the community um, and last summer, uh, between last summer and this summer, we have collected and distributed around 5,000 gently used children's books. So we are starting to accomplish that goal of recycling books back into the community. And um, that's been really great. In terms of impact, you know, um, impact on the bottom line is largely unknown right now. We are still very early um, in the work that we're doing here in Haverhill. And, um, as you can see from this chart, there's a big question mark on where we stand. Um, from 27 to 2017 to 2019, we, we were seeing a pretty great upward trajectory with our grade level reading scores. Um, I can't say that that's a direct impact to Haver Promise because we were still uh, very new at the time, but um, it, I do believe it has to do with um, a new superintendent and a community that was starting those conversations around equity and making um, small tweaks within the school district, um, adding positions. Um, our superintendent, Margaret Morata, is very focused on relationships. So she brought in um, bilingual parent liaisons for every school um, and hired a lot more literacy coaches and interventionists. And I believe that that's made a big difference um, in the district. So we were very excited to see where we, where we might land in 2020. And of course, this year in 2021, um, but as we all know, 
the that data is going to be a little bit tricky and um, that line's probably going to take a pretty drastic dip so um, it is hard to say like I said the the real impact on the bottom line but we do know that Haverhill Promise is having an impact um, in other ways in uh, one one way I wanted to share that was kind of exciting I was at uh, City Hall recently speaking with the Director of Community Development for Haverhill and um, he shared that his uh, community development block grant, which is a federal grant that he um, oversees and is able to dole out to different uh, nonprofits in the city. He said at the time of applications for this um, CDBG funding, he couldn't believe how many groups came forward that mentioned grade level reading as part of what they were going to use um, the funding for. And he said the fact that so many nonprofits in the city were talking about grade level reading he thought was great evidence of um, how our campaign was catching on and our messages were being received. So um, that, that was wonderful to hear. And I'll just quickly speak to kind of our COVID-19 response or pivot. Um, as I sort of mentioned, we were very close to submitting our CSAP and um, hit the pause button. <laughs> and what we did after that was we, we realized this was at the time we thought schools were going to close for about two weeks. We didn't realize that they were going to close until the end of the year. But we said, okay, one thing we can do is uh, we, can, we can run a citywide reading challenge and we can just encourage children to be reading for 20 minutes a day at home while the schools are shut down. And so we did that by offering gift cards and, and other incentives. Um, we saw over 750 participants, uh, unique participants in that program. Um, and it ended up running for 13 weeks because that was how long the schools ended up being closed. Um, thankfully, it ran right into the library's summer reading program. So we figured a lot of those kids that had been in the habit of reading for all those weeks could then um, take on the summer reading challenge through the library. And that was great. Um, but one thing we did realize was we can't encourage kids to read when they may not have books at home. And our, our library, like most libraries in, uh, in the country, I'm sure, was not open to the public. Um, they were also very hesitant about lending out their collection. Um, at that time, you know, if you remember, no one quite knew about germs on the surface and, and things like that. And so um, we were really concerned. You know, uh, a lot of students take books home at the end of the school year that they can use in the summer. We didn't have that opportunity with schools shutting down so suddenly. Um, so that's where we um, took in some donations. We sent out a Haverhill Public School bus driver with books to all of our summer meal distribution sites. Um, and we had a couple of bookmobile weeks. Um, and at the end of the summer, we created a mural, um, which I, I should have shared a, a finished image of that, but you can see that on our website. Um, we created what we're calling the Reading Takes Us Places mural. And what it is is a five panel mural that was um, painted by children who participated in the Citywide Reading Challenge during socially distant painting sessions um, at one of our partner organizations, Lawns. And um, what, what that showed us was it was a real motivator for many, uh, many students to, to be able to participate um, in painting the mural. And it, it, it really helped us see that there might be a, a great bridge between um, disciplines. And um, so we're really excited about how we might um, partner more with arts organizations in the city um, and bridge the two worlds of reading and, and um, the creative arts. And, and then um, the last thing we did um, in 2020, we did a attendance awareness poster design contest called School Every Day, No Matter Which Way. Um, and really the, the purpose of that was we, we were noticing that kids were not logging in, that um, attendance was very poor, especially um, during the remote learning times. And so we used the winter break to encourage students to think about um, creating an awareness poster to talk about um, school every day, no matter which way, whether it's on the computer or in person. And um, interestingly, you know, we, we saw some sad things come out of that design contest. We saw middle schoolers illustrating, you know, before COVID and after COVID um, and how they were missing their friends and things like that. So um, it was sort of a, a, yet another thing that came out of it was sort of seeing the emotional impact that it was having on our kids. And, um, but, you know, we also saw some really humorous designs. So it was interesting to see how children were coping 
um, with the pandemic. Um, and then I, I will say just another COVID-19 response was just in the summer um, and in the spring, we really were focusing on preschool. Like I said, we were, we were concerned about the children who hadn't gone to preschool and kindergarten um, and sort of trying to get them, those families back connected. Um, and so we, we offered a virtual preschool resource fair that was great with a lot of community partners involved. Um, we did some partner trainings with community groups around iReady, which is the um, online curriculum reading platform that uh, the schools were using to sort of continue the same um, learning pathway throughout the summer. Um, we did our literacy lunches, uh, which were halfway through and are going great. Um, and then the Moody play, Playful Learning Landscape was um, is, is still coming to fruition, but that was one where uh, our local preschool realized, you know, they were having to alternate how many classes could be on the playground at a time. And, um, you know, they, they discovered this area behind the school that was very well protected and, and very underutilized. And they came to me and said, hey, can we make this something, you know, because here we are, we can't use the playground. So we're just walking our classes around the building and it's really depressing, but what can we do with this space? And so, um, we got a small grant and we're working on turning that into a playful learning landscape that we're hoping will be a model for um, how we can incorporate learning elements into other underutilized, underutilized spaces in the city where families congregate and play. So that's where we are at. And I appreciate the time to be able to share. Thanks so much, Jenny. And it's so exciting to hear all that's happened in Haverhill in a pretty short amount of time. Um, and also kind of to hear the consistency and the kind of the re reiteration of so many of the themes we heard from Springfield. So as we kind of close and think about the campaign for grade level reading week, and as many communities across the country are tackling this work, we've heard advice that you have along the way. So I would just, as we close, ask each of you to share, you know, what would you want other communities to know? And then what is your hope for the children and families in your community, but then thinking about Massachusetts in general. So who would wanna go first? I'm happy to go. Okay, we'll start with you. Okay. <laughs> I would just say one, one piece of advice, I think um, is really to go where the energy is. I think, um, you know, in, in Haverhill in the beginning, we had all these ideas of where uh, you know, and ensuring that we were hitting all the priority areas and really doing something. Um, but whenever you're, you're working with volunteers or you're trying to inspire people to come around something, I, I think that it's important to go where the energy is, where the energy leads you um, and where people are really excited about a project or an idea. And uh, I'll just say one example of that. This book team that I was telling you about um, recently met and, and at really cool idea came out of it of how to um, engage our business community. We have a thriving restaurant district in Haverhill. Our mayor will say that we're the best res restaurant district north of Boston. I don't think that's true, but it's a claim that he likes to make often. Uh, but we do have some fantastic restaurants and um, they had an idea. You know, none of these restaurants have any kind of coloring books or anything for kids to do. What if we actually create a little coloring book, an actual storybook that kids could color while they're sitting at the restaurant and bring home and add to their home libraries? And, you know, uh, it, it ended up being really great that on the call was an incredible children's author, who uh, Dan Hines, who runs Stories Podcast, and that is one of the top children's podcasts um, in the world right now. And he's from Haverhill, and he said, hey, I've got the rights to all these stories I wrote. Let's put them in print and I'll even sponsor this. So you never know what's going to come out of a group. And, and oddly enough, you know, I think that that could make a really great impact in our city. And, and it's a way to get restaurants and unlikely partners involved. Um, so I guess just not being so rigid about, you know, what you're looking for and being open to hearing the, the members of your community and, and those, especially with the talents and resources um, who might be able to come up with a fantastic idea you never would have thought of. Great, thanks Jenny. Who else? I'd love to chime in. Um, I have this huge hope that um, we learn from the COVID crisis, um, that we learn from the 
now decades of work being done and have been done in that there's not one answer that early literacy is part of a complex system um, that we can't just, you know, oh, every kid's gonna get on this app and it's gonna solve, that's just not how it works. And it, I think that depth and complexity are sometimes overlooked. Um, Rep Vargas had a great um, comment about, you know, we're on a two year cycle, we gotta put out, we gotta, this is the long game. This is the long game. Um, and, you know, it, it took a, a lot of years to get here and still not where we wanna be. So it's not something that's gonna, you know, pop every kid in front of an iPad and hope for the best. You know, this is this is investing in people um, and, and the, the human impact um, is gonna have so much more, um, like such a stronger case to get our kids where they need to be. And it's gonna take time, it's gonna take money and energy and a lot of people and it's hard and we still have to do it. <laughs> like this is really hard work and it's gotta get done. Um, you know, you don't have to, what's that quote? You don't have to finish it today, but you definitely have to start it. Um, and I think that that is something I would want folks to know. Like this is the long haul. Um, we've, we've been through a couple of mayors, like we've been through a couple, lots of city councilors. We've been through some presidents um, and it's still not where we wanna be and there's still work to do. And I think there'll always be work to do when there's um, like systemic issues across our country and across the world, there will always be work to do. Um, sometimes, you know, waking up or staying up at night thinking about it, Jenny, you and I both, um, but waking up every morning and knowing like my job will never be done. Like that's important to have a mindset of continuous improvement, continuous work. Um, there are babies born every day, which is awesome. And there's new parents made every day. Um, and currently we have some new schools being made, uh, which is pretty nice. Um, but just knowing that this is because a complex thing, it's not gonna end and it's hard and we get to do it. Like it's our privilege to be able to, to work on this together. Thank you so much to Jenny and Chrissy, both of you for your leadership and your kind of can-do spirit, it is contagious. So Ty and Melissa, the last word to you two, uh, thinking about your roles as parents and community members, what do you have to say? Um, I can start for, oh, sorry. You wanna go ahead, Ty? <laughs> um, one thing I always have to think about as a parent and um, being an advocate as well as meeting families where they're at, um, because um, we don't know where they're at when it comes to their reading levels when it, as other parents, as we engage with them. Um, so being creative and letting them know what works for them and for their families, uh, whether it's again, meeting at the park and reading and singing and playing and, 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 and bonding is I guess the most important part of um, reading and literacy and um, just being supportive. And Ty, with the last word. Yeah, what, I, that word is creative, Melissa. When I was writing down my thoughts, creative is bubbled. Um, and when I think about being creative, like just really looking at the ways that we engage our families and build the capacity of the families in our community so that they can continue to do this work. And they're their child's first teacher. So just empowering them to be able to do that, providing them with quality, diverse and inclusive resources to do that is really important. Well, I cannot, uh, I can't thank you enough for joining us for this conversation. As folks are watching, um, we do have resources available. We will um, have this recording available. I'll also make sure the slides are available with their contact information. Um, and my hope is just that we continue to have um, people who are the closest to the work helping to inform policy. You know, we, we, we heard from parents, we heard about leadership changes and the work does continue. And we have had incredible leaders um, in communities who will not stop and will not quit. And um, our children are counting on us to ensure uh, their development, their support, and for the future of our Commonwealth, we know how critical this work is. So thank you for spending a little time in Massachusetts, both East and West. Uh, and we look forward to staying in touch and supporting children across the country. So thank you. Thank you.